me, me, me. <laughs> All right. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is Tobias Landberg, and I am the director of research at the Amphibian Foundation. And I'm a biologist, and my job here at the Amphibian Foundation is to direct the bridge program for conservation research and to direct all of our conservation research biology projects. So I've been in this job on site for about half a year, and I started working remotely before that. So I'm relatively new to the Atlanta area. We just moved down here in December. Um, we are working here at the Amphibian Foundation headquarters at the Blue Heron Nature Preserve in Buckhead. And um, the way that my job is sort of structured is that um, our executive director is Mark Mandika and he has started this with the uh, co-founder Crystal Mandika, who uh, is the director of education, and they started this about two, three years ago, and uh, event, you know, grew the the foundation and took on so many different projects that eventually Mark couldn't handle them all, and so he took all the fun parts of his job and gave them to me. And so I get to do all of the work with um, students, with bridge program students, volunteers, and interns doing our various conservation research projects. So we have three really high priority species um, of coastal plain endemics that we work with, gopher frogs, striped newts, and frosted flatwood salamanders, various levels of uh, imperiled amphibians that share uh, a, a, an endangered habitat in coastal, uh, in the coastal plain of, of Georgia and surrounding areas. And we also work with um, urban ecology and restoration in the metro Atlanta area. And so I am um, overseeing the Metro Atlanta Amphibian Monitoring Program, which is a program that uh, Mark started looking at various wetlands and habitats uh, in the metro Atlanta area. And we are monitoring those with the help of volunteers. Um, and if anyone is interested in volunteering or working with us, you can go to our website. We have a beautiful website. Mark is an amazing illustrator and photographer and web designer. Um, and so we have a website filled with lots of information on the species we work with, with our projects. Um, there are ways that you guys can support us if you want. And of course, we would love to have you follow us on all, the, all your favorite social media platforms. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram if you like amphibians and reptiles and beautiful images of animals and following our research you can do all those on our social media and that's a bullfrog um, all right now we are down at the creek this is the mill creek that runs through the blue heron nature preserve and since during the global pandemic, um, our research ability has been severely limited by the fact that we can't pile a bunch of students in a car together and drive for three or four hours to get to a distant field site. What we've done is um, we have adapted our research program as part of the bridge program for conservation research to work on our local creek. And it's a two-part study that we have undertaken. Uh, first of all, we wanted to clean up the creek and make sure that the habitat is as good and clean as possible for the animals and, uh, that live here and for the people who use it. And so we have divided the creek up into 10 meter sections and we have counted and categorized every single piece of litter and trash in the creek 
on the banks and three meters on each side of the bank. And what um, we have found all sorts of different types of trash, everything that's bigger than the size of a pencil eraser we have picked up and uh, categorized it in terms of is it made of plastic, styrofoam, glass, or some other material. Um, we've also used functional categories such as food wrappers, um, plastic bottles, or toys such as um, tennis balls or playground balls and things, things like that. And then we have cleaned it all out and categorized it so that we can understand what is the potential source of where this trash has, is coming from and what's the potential impact on the animals. And the other part of the study that we've been doing is that we have been documenting all the amphibians and reptiles. So it, we've done two complete uh, creek cleanups uh, with our volunteers and interns while maintaining social distance because uh, one of the advantages of working here is that we can be outside, we can maintain that distance um, and still work safely and collect data and do community service. We've, in the very first uh, creek cleanup, we had over 4,000 pieces of trash that, that we cleaned up and uh, removed and, and counted and mapped on our on our map. In the second one, we found significantly less. It was more like 1,600 pieces of trash and litter um, that happened about three or four weeks later. So some of that was some things that we probably missed, but most of that was new stuff that was coming in. Typically, when, during heavy rain events, uh, the trash and litter will be swept in from upstream and from the entire watershed around us. Um, and we've also uh, documented over 500 observations of amphibians and reptiles. We have the two-lined stream salamander which lives in the creek. It has an aquatic larva and it has a semi-aquatic adult phase so it will typically be on the edges underneath cover objects such as uh, rocks and logs or leaf packs uh, and they can venture up away from the creek but are typically most often found right next to it. Also a lot of green frogs and southern leopard frogs and tadpoles uh, occur here. We've documented two lizard species, the five-lined skink and the green anole. And we've documented three species of turtle. We've seen snapping turtles, uh, uh, big ones over 35 pounds, including some that we've seen multiple times. My favorite is I call Mr. Mudface because he likes to lay in shallow water in this marshy area with his shell out of water and his face in the mud. Um, he weighs about 35 pounds and he's really big and old and uh, very adorable and good tempered. And then we have musk turtles, which are very small, one of um, the country's smallest turtles as adults. They're about four inches long. They are actually have pound for pound a stronger bite force than a snapping turtle if it had a similar sized head because they eat hard bodied prey. So they eat. Um, clams and snails and uh, other things that have hard shells typically and they have very big strong jaw muscles they're highly aquatic um, they live in creeks like this and they live in uh, the marshy part of of the pond down uh, downstream and then we also have pond sliders yellow-bellied sliders uh, which is the native subspecies and uh, the red-eared slider, which is the introduced subspecies of the slider. Um, they are morphologically, they look a little different. Um, they can hybridize and interbreed, um, but the red-eared slider was, uh, has been introduced to every continent on the planet except Antarctica, and it's probably just a matter of time before they get established there as well. They are really good at being invaders, 
Um, we carry them around from place to place. We've sold them uh, as the dime store turtle uh, for 70 years at least. Um, they are very popular in the pet trade and so they have um, often they have really long lives and people uh, like to buy them when they're small and then often get bored with them and think it's a good idea to put them out and free them even though they don't belong uh, in that area and they are hardy and adaptable and uh, oftentimes will outcompete local and native species and so when we find red-eared sliders here um, we remove them and bring them in to make them into outreach animals. So we turn them into teachers and educators um, in our events and programs to help teach people about um, turtles and turtle biology, but also about invasive species and preserving and restoring our natural habitat here. I mentioned Jack is starting today in the bridge program. His research project that we have made for him is to gonna be to study the turtles on the Blue Heron Nature Preserve. So um, this is one of the areas where I've seen a big snapping turtle that likes to live down in that pool. And so when, whenever we're hiking along this trail, I like to keep my eye up um, to see if we can find these snapping turtles because they have very regular habits that they like their little spots where they hang out. <gasps> There's, they're hanging out together. Jack, 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 Jack. Oh, one just went down. The other one is is right there. You see him? So there's two snapping turtles that are hanging out together. And the other one just went down. So she's just keeping an eye on us to see if I go into the pond, she'll know to like go down and, and head out. Um, but she just wants to keep an eye on me. She's very wary. She has a big crunched in part of her shell. Um, probably from when she came out to nest, females are much more vulnerable than males because females have to come out to lay their eggs on land. And she probably got hit by a car. Um, it looks like the only thing that could crush that big of a snapping turtle shell. And it's healed into this crunched in sort of pattern. The best thing to do if you see a snapping turtle in the road is to stop traffic and just let it cross on its own. There are safe ways to handle snapping turtles, um, but they can still scratch you um, at, in a defensive way if uh, they are uh, grabbed. It's not a good idea to lift them by their tails as many people think that's the safest way to handle them, but it can actually harm them by doing that. And so I'll demonstrate the way that a professional biologist, I have 25 years of experiencing, uh, experience handling these animals and uh, can safely do it. So this animal is trying to orient a I'm gonna grab it by the tail and slide my hand under. And now I can steer the animal with this hand and support the weight underneath with the other hand. And with both hands, I have a secure grip on the turtle and it's not gonna fall and it can't bite me. You always wanna move snapping turtles in the direction that they were 
moving. They know their landscape, they know where they want to go. If it was heading across the road, you can cross it to the other side um, or let it cross on its own and just try to stay out of its way. If you approach it, uh, it typically will stop moving. So giving it space is the best uh, way to help it. So say hi to my little friend and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go put you back and make sure that you're safe and happy and living your best turtley life, eating plants and carrying and looking gorgeous. All right, Jack, did you get a picture or two? I got plenty. All right. Um, can you see, by the way, it's penis? Oh, look at that, there it is. So this is how we know it's a male. Males store their penis in the tail, and males have longer tails than females. So that's gross. Um, welcome to Metamorphosis Meadow. This is our outdoor research facility at the Amphibian Foundation on the Blue Heron Nature Preserve. And this is where we are raising many species of amphibians in these outdoor tanks in order to um, have uh, captive colonies uh, that, we can, that we call captive assurance colonies. Uh, we're trying to prevent their extinction. We're doing conservation and we are head starting uh, gopher frogs out here. So I'd be happy to show you some of these tanks and the way that they're set up um, so that you can see a little bit about how we do our conservation efforts. Um, the animals living in this tank are called gopher frogs. This is Georgia's rarest frog species. And we are working with the Georgia uh, Division of Natural Resources to head start these animals. And what that means is that we collected them as eggs. Uh, we brought them here and they hatched out. We have approximately 50 animals in each of these tanks and we are supplementing the natural food that occurs. You can see the green algae that is growing naturally in the pond, in the mesocosm tank. Um, they eat this algae. There is aquatic vegetation. Maiden cane uh, is, a, is a, a type of grass that grows in their natural habitat in the coastal plain of Georgia and uh, the Southeast United States. And they eat uh, this vegetation, the bacterial film that grows on, on this aquatic vegetation is emergent, typically grass, that grows out of ephemeral wetlands where these animals uh, come from. So the habitat that they come from is highly endangered. Uh, it is sand hills, habitat, and longleaf pine savanna. That habitat has largely been lost. Over 95% of that habitat has been lost throughout uh, the coastal plain in the last 20 years 
due to development um, and uh, turning it into uh, plantations for longleaf, longleaf pine. These are ephemeral wetland species, which means that they rely on uh, small bodies of water that typically dry out um, every so often, typically every year, but it might be every couple of years. What that does is it changes the community and allows certain vegetation types and certain animal species to persist while excluding other species. So if it dries up, that means fish can't live there. And since fish are important predators of frog tadpoles and eggs, uh, that means it excludes fish from those habitats. One of the main problems with this habitat um, that remains is that it's a fire dominated habitat, which means we need fire to sweep through and burn it periodically, or that habitat will undergo ecological succession and the grasses and, and herbaceous vegetation will give way to shrubs and that'll give way to trees and eventually that it'll be shaded because it'll have canopy cover and those trees will pull out the moisture and in combination with global climate change the hydrological if, uh, dynamics or the the pattern of when the water is there how much water is there um, won't match the biology of these animals so we do manage some of this habitat and uh, there are artificial uh, burns where uh, burn bosses and burn crews will come in and burn the habitat and um, unfortunately what happens uh, in a lot of this area is that it's burnt at the wrong time of year if you burn in the winter when it's the safest time to burn then there's often water in those wetlands and those areas won't burn and then uh, you might have properly managed the upland and 98 percent of the habitat but the most important two percent doesn't get burnt it won't function properly and so uh, this is one of the the biggest problems with uh, why these animals are undergoing um, you know population extinctions and uh, being uh, reduced in the number of animals that you see in the landscape even in habitat that's protected and managed for for fire so these are some of the problems that these animals are dealing with and why we uh, consider this one of our highest priority species we work with several species including the gopher frog the striped newt and the frosted flatwood salamanders are three high priority species that all rely on this type of habitat you can see around the edge there's some big chunky tadpoles there's one right here <laughs> he got away. Wow. Again. That is a monster. <laughs> so here we have uh, Georgia's rarest frog species. This is a tadpole of the gopher frog. And my favorite thing about gopher frogs is that as adults, they will burrow um, and use the burrows of gopher tortoises um, in order to escape the fires. There are over 300 different species that have been found using gopher tortoise burrows as what we call refugia or places to hide. They are, um, they're deep, they can be 30 feet underground, uh, 30 feet long. They have high moisture content, um, so animals don't dry out in this very sandy, um, often dry and hot uh, habitat. And um, it's a place that they, it's relatively cool. So when fire sweeps through, they can be protected uh, living down there and there's a lot of other important species that live there indigo snakes is a highly endangered snake species that's endemic to this habitat as well we also find pine snakes and diamondback rattlesnakes 
and 300 other species of uh, amphibians and reptiles and insects primarily that will use these uh, gopher tortoise burrows. So gopher tortoises are keystone species in that without them making those burrows, you don't have places for hundreds of other species to be protected and survive. So I think of gopher tortoises a little bit like the beavers of the um, coastal plain habitat in that beavers often engineer entire landscapes and change the habitat for other things uh, in a similar way that gopher tortoises will uh, affect the habitat of things like this amazing chubby happy gopher frog tadpole. Just look at that beast. So over here, what we have is a whole array of triphasic mesocosms. I already showed you an aquatic mesocosm that's filled with just water and tadpoles and some aquatic vegetation. These are really special mesocosms because they have three distinct habitat types in them. There's an aquatic part which has water at the bottom, there's an upland part which is relatively dry, and then there's an ecotone in between, which is a transition uh, type of habitat. And this is ideal for raising salamanders that have a complex life cycle, where they breed in water, they lay eggs in aquatic uh, habitats, the eggs will hatch out into an aquatic larva, like a tadpole, except they have legs uh, at all stages of life. And then when they metamorphose, they'll crawl up out of the water and um, go upland and typically burrow underground. So all of the animals that we have out here, the salamanders are mole salamander species. We have a lot of different species, including our highest priority species, the frosted flatwoods. Um, they're really hard to find. They burrow really deep underground and we don't want to disturb their habitat. So I'm going to show you a different species. Uh, this is a spotted salamander tank, and this is one of the most beautiful, one of my absolute favorite uh, salamanders of all time. And uh, we'll see if we can find some of these spotted salamanders hanging around. We have some spotted salamander populations in Metro Atlanta. Um, we have documented at least three or four in the Metro Atlanta Amphibian Monitoring Program. And so this is just to keep um, predators out and to keep people from uh, disturbing the habitat. But you can see here we have a nice aquatic section with uh, water that's standing and when it rains this will fill up to the height of a standpipe that's on the outside and if it goes above that height then the water will just drain out and so this doesn't flood uh, which is important because as aqua as larvae they're aquatic but as adults they are terrestrial and as I mentioned they are burrowing species, they're fossorial, which means they spend 98% of their time underground, uh, which is why they're called mole salamanders. Um, that's the family of salamander they're, they're in, and the particular species is spotted salamanders. And I'm gonna carefully, Whoa, do you see that guy? So this is a relatively small juvenile salamander, but just absolutely gorgeous. Bright yellow polka dots, orange on its head. This is a widely distributed species that it lives throughout Eastern North America. It's a relatively common species in a lot of areas in New England, um, all the way up into Canada, and 
up to Nova Scotia, these animals will breed in ephemeral wetlands, typically uh, with other species like wood frogs. So the larvae are carnivorous, which is different from frog tadpoles. Frog tadpoles uh, are generally herbivorous vegetarian or eat plants for the most part. They will also scavenge uh, if, if they find something, but salamander larvae are almost exclusively carnivorous. So they eat aquatic insects, uh, copepods, daphnia, any small crustaceans or things living in the water column, uh, soft-bodied prey such, such as worms, all those kinds of things. Uh, mosquito larvae, they eat um, millions of. And then they metamorphose, they resorb their external gills, they resorb their tail fin, and they transform and walk out onto land as this adorable little salamander. And they can get, they can get big, um, up to eight or nine inches long as adults. They can also live really long time. They have been documented in captivity to live over 25 years. And in the wild, uh, it would probably be, you know, probably be rare to get up that old, but it certainly is possible for them to live decades um, at, as adults. So it's life, life on, in, in the slow lane. Salamanders, uh, as you can see, tend to be very chill. Um, they use chemical defenses in their skin um, to protect them and often have bright colors like this to warn potential predators um, that if they do bite them, they often get a mouthful of acrid, bitter, acidic, or otherwise distasteful um, toxins that is secreted in the skin and these bright colors may help to reinforce that message for next time they see them they won't want to uh, bite into them. So all of, in all of these tanks we have uh, breeding colonies of these animals. We are trying to establish them in these outdoor mesocosms so that they will breed and undergo their entire life cycle and we can have these captive assurance colonies where we can either use them to start new populations in areas where they might have been uh, extirpated or uh, where they once lived but the habitat was not suitable and maybe we've done restoration or he just took off didn't he yeah he walked away um he got bored <laughs> um so uh we're doing restoration in Atlanta, trying to repopulate and grow the numbers of this species, which normally, you know, historically would have been in, you know, just many of the ephemeral wetlands uh, that periodically uh, fill up with water and then uh, typically would dry out during the summer. But they have a lot of habitat requirements. They need that ephemeral or vernal pool and then they need an upland habitat that is suitable for the adults. So there's a lot of parts to the recipe to make sure that, that they're happy and can, can thrive. And we also wanna produce them here um, so that we can put them into the hands of other conservation organizations. So zoos and, uh, and, and other groups that might want to breed them and have genetic stock in case something happens. Uh, some of the animals that we have here are federally endangered. They have very low population numbers. The Frosted Flatwoods has a couple of ponds left in Georgia, maybe just one female in one pond that's still producing. And we have a lot of animals that have been salvaged um, from the pond when the pond was drying up and the larvae weren't going to have time to metamorphose. The, um, the Federal Fish and Wildlife went in and took those animals. We're the lead on the recovery 
for that species, the um, federal you know, recovery plan. And so they put them in our care and um, we want to breed them in our captive assurance colony and make sure if something happened to our population, they wouldn't be extinct and that we have them in the hands. There's a lot of other conservation organizations that want to work with these species. So let's see if we can find another one. Oh, hello. Normally, this animal, you would never see it, except if you're out on a rainy, cold night at the end of winter, beginning of spring, um, you know, 50 degrees and raining, these animals would be crossing from their upland habitat, working their way down to the vernal pool where they're going to mate and lay eggs. They spend maybe a week in the pool and then come up and migrate on another rainy night and, uh, and then they would spend the whole rest of the year underground looking adorable and thinking their adorable salamander thoughts. My goodness. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> Sorry, I love them so much. Um, all right, so I also wanted to tell you about our bridge program because this is a unique program that we offer at the Amphibian Foundation. So the Amphibian Foundation does conservation work. We have already learned about some of our high priority species that we're working with in our outdoor research facility at our field research center. Uh, we also are breeding animals in the lab, for example, striped newts, and we have lots of outreach animals, and we can't go in there today because we have to maintain social distance and those labs are uh, very tightly spaced. Um, but our newest program that, that we're offering, in addition to our online camps and things that we have been developing recently in order to respond to the global pandemic, um, is our bridge program for conservation research. This is a unique program that is the only one of its kind in the world where students can come to the Amphibian Foundation and get hands-on experience working with high priority amphibians, uh, doing conservation and learning about amphibian biology and how to do science and become biologists. Um, and we focus on adapting our curriculum to the needs of the specific student. So I'm the director of the program and I will work directly with each student to design a curriculum that suits their career goals. It could be for high school students that have uh, graduated and are heading into college but they're not quite ready academically um, or intellectually or socially or career-wise they may not be ready to make some choices and they wanted to up the level of their academic uh, ability and so I would work with them and we would find experiences and a curriculum that would help them build those skills. Um, it could be for students that are in college and wanted to get research experience but didn't necessarily have opportunities at their institution um, and so they could come and work with us for a semester or a year um, and we're actually launching new uh, short courses uh, programs that are either five or ten weeks long for the summer to try to help a lot of the people who um, have just been coming out of this really tough semester where everything was online and they missed a lot of experiences and they wanted to get outdoor experience working in the field, um, working with a close mentor 
We do a lot with peer mentoring. We have other students that work with, with them, more advanced volunteers and interns. And we of course have lots of partners and lots of people that do different types of conservation biology. Uh, we focus on career development, we focus on transition services, and we focus on research-based experiential learning. So the career development means that, that students get exposed to lots of different people doing lots of different jobs in conservation biology, and a lot of that has to do with communication. So uh, it could be scientific illustrators, it could be journalists, it could be uh, career scientists, professors, or out people who do outreach and education. And so a full spectrum of, of different types of experiences that students can get exposed to. And then we focus on those transition services, so developing uh, CVs and resumes to help build and boost uh, the communication of what the students' experiences is, what their goals are, and help them achieve that through writing, we use social media, we use blog articles, we encourage um, a lot of communication in its different forms because uh, conservation is primarily done with people more than it's even done with plants or animals and things like that. So it's about learning how to communicate and this will help build those skills uh, for future academics. And we've also had students, um, we have one of our students now and a student coming in who are post-graduates, meaning they got their college degree, they went off into the field that they chose and they decided this wasn't exactly what they wanted. And so they wanted to get into conservation and really um, invest in their passion for animals and uh, amphibians or reptiles and came to us to um, explore that and find an avenue to get into conservation research without having to start at the bottom and get a whole new degree. So we're trying to create opportunities for lots of different types of people uh, from diverse backgrounds get into conservation because we need diversity. We need diversity of, of organisms, plants, and animals, and we need a diversity of people um, to get those ideas and to have different groups uh, represented in the conservation biology field. Brain for conservation biology. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, uh, already, right off the name with the Amphibian Foundation, um, amphibians, reptiles, they're my favorite group of animal by far. Uh, and for so long I've done, you know, like a lot of biology majors, uh, taking plenty of classes that I got to learn about different, you know, cell cycles and development of animals, evolution, all that good stuff. Uh, but I never really got to do a whole lot of on hands work uh, until this past semester. And as part of that, uh, actually Dr. Uh, Landberg gave a uh, guest lecture uh, over video call. And I was like, oh, Amphibian Foundation, that looks cool. Uh, reached out, applied, and uh, really I just wanted to get some uh, hands-on, sort of get my feet wet, in this case maybe literally, uh, in just ecology and in conservation. Um, I love these animals. They're, in my opinion, some of the most amazing things in the earth. And I really just like to work with them, work with keeping them around and keeping the place that they live uh, fresh and healthy. Uh, and I guess on top of that, bringing that passion out and uh, sharing with other people, helping them learn and understand uh, the place that they're living, uh, the critters they're seeing, and just bringing it all together is really just something that I I can really see myself getting into and really see myself doing for a long time.